I find Christmas, so when I was a child, Christmas wasn't a great time, and it's, it's not always a great time for everybody, is it? It just depends on your context, your background, uh, upbringing, and so on. But um, it's, 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 it's awesome to be able to have that time of year redeemed in some way, shape, or form. Uh, by others. My wife redeemed Christmas for me, actually. When I was growing up, Christmas was just not a big deal. Christmas Eve was the, the moment my mother decided to tell my father that she was leaving him. Um, and so I've got a Christmas tree in the background in my memory when that information was passed on to me and my little sister. Um, so Christmas was never an overly joyful time for me. And then uh, the one Christmas I do remember was getting up when I was living with my dad and going to the tree, he was still asleep. I just opened my gift and put it back down and went back to bed. And that was our Christmas celebrations. But being married to this woman has redeemed Christmas for me. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have quite a big uh, Christmas set up in our family. And uh, I'm one of those guys that never feels like he's got enough. Anyone else like that? Or is it just a dysfunction in my life? That at 11.59 Christmas Eve, I'm still wondering if there's a shop open that I can go and get something else for somebody and, 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 and you know, fill the lounge room with, with presents and gifts. Anyone ever had a gift fail? Had a gift fail, yeah? All the men. How many men have bought vacuums for their wives for Christmas? <laughs> you silly people. You silly people. Or a drill. Any men here bought a drill for their wife? Not that there's a problem with that. If your wife wanted a drill, that's great. I've got a mate of mine. His name's Joe. He's an artistic sort of a guy. And I went shopping with Joe many years ago. And um, we went to the Gold Coast to shop. And I was buying stuff for my wife, perfume, clothes, all the nice things that I know my wife likes. And when I reconnected with Joe and asked him what he got for his wife, he bought her the Mad Max DVD box set. <laughs> And I thought it was a stitch up and he said, no, no, I did. And, and what happened on Christmas Day, I found out was the minute she opened it, he put it on and started watching Mad Max. That's the kind of gift that's given for ulterior motives. It's not given for the person, is it? It's kind of given for your own, uh, your own uh, benefit. I want to talk a little bit this morning, I guess, and bounce off this whole idea of uh, a gift. Um, how many of you found it difficult to get the right gift for the Casper kids who struggled with that? I, I did, yeah. I, I, I found it hard. And I'm walking around the shopping centre thinking, you know, why am I finding this so difficult? And then I realised, you know why I'm finding it so difficult? Because I'm actually, I feel like I'm shopping for, even though I don't know these children, it felt like I'm going through the same process I do with my own children. It felt like I was shopping for my own kids. And, and when, you, when you shop for somebody to get a gift, you, and if you do do this, then shame on you. You don't just run into a shop and go, oh, I'm running out of time, I'll grab the first thing my hand touches and go, you know, you, re you, you think about that gift, don't you? Because you want that gift to reflect, the, the gift reflects your heart for that particular individual. You want that gift to, to mean something to that person. You want to you wanna give a gift. When I buy gifts for my children, what I love about the, the whole process at Christmas is when they unwrap the present and they see the gift, and they get that big smile on their face. Anyone experience? And they get that smile on their face because they see that thing. Because it's something you've thought about it. It's something you know they needed or something they wanted. But you give them this gift. And what the gift does is it, it, it ultimately it brings a sense of life to the children, doesn't it? Who wants to give your children a gift and have them open it up and go, oh. Nobody wants that. We don't buy gifts to disappoint. We buy gifts to, to, to bring joy. We buy gifts to bring life. We think about the gifts that we're giving because the gift itself is kind of step one to a bigger outcome than just the gift itself. The gift is the thing we give, but it's what the gift brings into the life of the recipient. That's really the point. Um, in, in Luke chapter 2, Verse 8 and 10, the, the, the guy that wrote this ancient document that we called Luke. How many of you know the Bible is not, it wasn't written as a book, someone didn't sit down and write, no, it's 66 ancient documents that were written over 1,500 years. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, we, we, we pick this up now and we go, we call it the biggest selling book of all time, but it, 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 it was never a book, it was never intended to be a book. In, in between these two leather covers, I have 66 ancient documents written over a period of 1,500 years by, by 20 something different authors, written from palaces, from caves, from deserts, from wilderness, and somehow all of these ancient documents written throughout this large period of time in so many different places by so many different people all weave the exact same story into it, pointing to a time when God would do something to remove that barrier between mankind and himself, that thing that Christians call sin. 
It's an amazing, amazing collection of documents. So don't take it for granted when you go home. And some of us have got 30 of these. How many of you have got about 20 of these at home collecting dust all over the place, every translation, a version, and so on? Yeah, you're going to keep your hands down. Don't want to stay humble. Some of us have got too many copies of this thing floating around. No matter how many copies we got, do we spend time in it? And do we actually understand the power that's in these words? It's not like reading Woman's Day, not like reading a Tom Clancy novel. Anyone like Tom Clancy novels? You know, I don't mind some of that sort of stuff. The movies are better. They're over an hour and a half, but the books take a lot longer. But um, it's not like reading any other book. There's, there, there's something uh, powerful about this thing. But, you know, there have been nations throughout human history that have actually tried to remove this from their nations. They've had burn-offs where they've gathered all the Bibles and burnt them. Why are they doing that? Why is there such a push to get rid of the Word of God? Well, it's because it's living, it's active, it's powerful. It's not a book. It's a collection of, uh, it, it's a story throughout history that's pointing towards the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. The Old Testament looks forward to a moment in history called the cross. And the New Testament, if you read it, it's pointing back to a moment in human history called the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate that at Easter time. Uh, but right now we're talking, we're getting closer to Christmas and we're talking about gifts. In, in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and 10, Luke writes this. He says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Fair call, by the way. I mean, if you were out in the middle of a field, you know, walking your dog or something, and a light shone and, and the glory of God fell, I'd probably freak out too. So that's a fair call. The angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. And he said this, I bring you good news. It's going to cause great joy for all people. The good news that this angel was bringing was actually about a really, really good gift, wasn't it? It was about a gift that was going to be uh, given to mankind, and that gift was Jesus, God in human form. It was a gift that was meant to bring life to the recipients. Just like those Christmas gifts that you're buying, you're wanting those gifts to bring joy and to bring life into the recipients of that gift. Well, so does God want the, the life, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, the gift of Christ, to bring life into your world, to bring joy into your world, to bring peace into your world. How many of you know that? That's not always the, the, the story, is it? How many of you know Christians that are, uh, they got saved and they became worse? Grumbling, complaining, negative, critical. Instead of exuding the life that God came to give us, the life that Jesus said he came to hand to us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Those of you that know Jesus in this place, I'm speaking to you. And if you don't, that's fine. But maybe you can think about this question too. Are you fully able to enjoy the gift that God has given you through Jesus? Are you actually able to fully enjoy the gift that God has given to you through Jesus. I wonder what you think about, I wonder what your primary thought is when somebody starts to talk about Jesus, or when somebody brings up the life of Jesus. What, what, what's, what are the first thoughts that kind of come to your mind? There'll be some people here, and when you think about the Jesus story, what you're going to think about is you're going to think about punishment for sin. That's the first thing you're going to think about. You're going to think about this whole Jesus thing was because God was so angry at the way the world had screwed up and all the dumb things we had done and our decision to turn our back on him and to walk our own way. And let's look at the world today and you can see the mess we've created. It's not God's fault. God created man, put us here on planet Earth and said, you guys look after it and do the right thing. We haven't looked after it really well. We haven't looked after each other really well. We haven't governed really well. We haven't looked after the environment. We haven't done a whole bunch of things really, really well. And people want to blame God. It's not God's fault. God put us here and said, you guys take care of it. You guys do the right thing. You've got a choice. You can do things my way or you can take the highway. It's up to you. You can choose what you want. We didn't want to go my way. So many of us took the highway and there's a lot of bad luck stories and a lot of crashed out lives because we just thought we could do it on our own. But a lot of people, when they think of the Jesus story, they're going to think of punishment for sin. I remember being at a football match many years ago with my wife, and um, we were sitting up in Brisbane at the, what used to be called Lang Park, and we're sitting there, and uh, we walked into the stadium. It was her first ever live international sporting event, and I thought, so just so you know, she wanted to go. It wasn't me giving her Mad Max DVD box set, making her come to a footy game with me. She actually wanted to go. Uh, it was her idea. So we get there, we're sitting down, and next to us were these two guys, and one was just drunk. He's off his nut, 
completely off his chops. And he was sitting there, and I was here, and Jackie was there, but his brother was with him, and his brother was a lot more sober and down to earth. His brother realised that his, the guy next to me was being a bit rowdy, so he stood up and said to his brother, how about we swap seats? So I'm sitting next to the guy that's not off his chops. And we're sitting there having a chat and conversation turns to what do we do? And me and Jackie had just returned from India at that point. So I told him, well, you know, we've been doing work over in India and I explained what we we're doing. And he said, so you're missionaries, that's the word they used. And I said, well, yeah, we, we, we believe in Jesus. And, and if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be over there doing what I was doing. I'd be building my own empire here in Australia, trying to become the best I can be. But because of Jesus, I look beyond myself now and I want to be a blessing to the world around me. And so I said, yeah, that's what we were doing. And he said, I want to tell you a story. And he said, here's what happened to me. He said, I was brought up in a convent. Uh, Mum and dad, for whatever reason, didn't want me. And I was brought up in this convent. And what used to happen is when I was 10 years of age, I had a problem, I would wet the bed. Anybody wet their bed at 10 years old? <laughs> Anybody wet it at 20? <laughs> just checking, just checking, good people. Um, and if you do, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, it's okay. Anyone start wetting their bed at about 60? Just another question. So anyway, what happens is I'm sitting next to this guy and he tells me the story. He says, when I was 10, I used to wet my bed. And, he, and then he says, and you know what would happen? The nuns would come on into the room, they would grab a big stick and they would beat me for wetting my bed. You know what he was saying to me? What he was saying to me was, when I think of God, I think of punishment for doing the wrong things. I think of, of, of being punished for everything wrong that I do and God is like those nuns who come on in and beat a 10-year-old boy with a big stick because he wet his bed. And all I could say to him in that moment was, can I just give you another picture, reframe that moment in your life? When them nuns were hitting you with a big stick, Jesus was sitting on the bed next to you crying because God doesn't hit 10-year-old boys with a big stick for wetting their bed. And I left that with him, never seen him again. I hope that God was able to use that to reframe what he thought. But some people will think of the Jesus story and all we think of is punishment for sin. So when we think about Jesus in our life, all we're constantly thinking about is punishment for sin, punishment for sin, punishment for sin. There'll be other people who will purely think of the Jesus story only as forgiveness for sin. All that the Jesus story was about was forgiveness for sin. Now, how many of you know that when Jesus died on the cross, according to Isaiah, he did take upon himself the punishment for our sin? And sin, by the way, put it in everyday language, sin simply means missing the mark. It was a term that was used a lot in archery back in, in, in Jesus' time. Uh, and, and there would be a target up the back there that the archer was aiming for, and he would stand back here, draw his bow, and boom, let it go. The arrow would sail through the air. And if the arrow fell short of the mark, there would be a guy up the end there, hopefully completely out of the way, in case the archer was a bad shot. And the guy up the end would call out, Sin! And what that meant was you missed the mark. So when Christians talk about sin, what we mean is we've missed the mark that God wants us to aim at. We've, we're not living the way that God designed us to live. That's what we mean by that. It's, it's, sometimes it gets all religious, but that's what it means. We miss the mark that God has set for us. And, and how many of you know that, yes, Jesus did die upon that cross as a punishment for sin? Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. In other words, can you imagine if our government had a bunch of laws and then they said, look, for example, if I beat my wife then, um, you know, there's a punishment for that. How many of you know that? So don't go beating your wives. Wives, don't beat your husbands too. I know some of you ladies. Um, <laughs> and, and so, Judy. And so, um, if, if there's something that I do wrong, and there's a punishment for that, isn't there? We understand that in the natural. Your children do something wrong. You probably discipline them in some way. You do something wrong at work. Your employer probably pulls you into line and disciplines you in some way. I'm glad that if somebody murders, murders my neighbour, that they end up going away to prison. I'm glad that there's a punishment for some of those things to deter people and so on. And, and can you imagine if, if the government said, here's what we're going to say as far as murder. We're telling you, do not murder your neighbour, but if you do... In other words, it's not a law, is it? It's just simply good advice. We're just dishing out good advice, hoping you'll take good advice. How many of you always take good advice? How many of you have sometimes not taken good advice? So there's a punishment. That's, that, 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 that's the reason why we have punishments. And, and, and for some reason, God seems to be the only being in the known universe that's not allowed to have a standard, is it? You ever noticed that? I was listening to a lady one day on the talkback radio, and she rang up, and she was talking about God, and she said, God is just love. And if God is love, then that just means that you should be able to do whatever you want, when you want, because you want, because that's what love is. Love means you can just be free to be you and do you and have what you want and so on. Can you now, now logically think about that? 
How loving would that actually be if we had no boundaries and parameters and we all just were free to do whatever we felt like at any point in time? That would be love. Well, what ends up happening is my love tells me that I'm going to rearrange our lounge room and I'm going to move a motorbike into there. I'm going to get a bigger TV. I'm going to stop, you know, my fishing gear is going to go up on the wall. That's my love. But my wife says to me, well, that encroaches on my love because it's not going to work. So when we think of a world where it's just all about love and no boundaries, can you imagine going to the workplace and it was just open slowly? You do whatever you want at work. How, cre- how productive would work be? Nothing in life works that way, but when it comes to God, we think that's how God should be. God is just love. That means everybody just do their own thing. It's kind of ludicrous that even if, if you don't believe in the concept of a God but you entertain me for a second, wouldn't it make sense that the most powerful being in the universe would be allowed to have some type of parameters for life if your boss is allowed to, if you're allowed to have one in your house, if your school has one, if the shopping centre has one, if the government has one, but God's not allowed to. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So Jesus did die on a cross as punishment for sin. Yes, he did. And did Jesus' death bring to us forgiveness of sin? Well, yes, it did. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, One day, each of us are going to leave this planet. I want you to, has anyone ever flown anywhere? You probably haven't in the last two years. But before that, do you remember the planes? We used to get in planes and we used to lift up off the ground and fly, yeah? You remember that? We used to do that once upon a time. It used to freak me out. I hate flying, but I used to do a fair bit of it. And you go to a departure lounge and you're standing in the departure lounge and, and, and one thing, it doesn't matter what departure lounge you go to in the world, there's one thing that everyone in that departure lounge has in common. They're all going to depart. <laughs> they're all going to depart. Everyone's gonna, they're all going to go somewhere. In the end, they're only there for a limited time. You can sit there and maybe your flight's in 12 hours. Maybe your flight's in an hour, you know. Maybe your flight's the next day, but you you camp there because you can't leave that airport and go. But we're all in that departure lounge because they're going somewhere. And, you know, life is like a big departure lounge in one sense, isn't it? We're all kind of here for a period, but we're all going to go. One day, every single one of us, I don't care how clever you are, how rich you are, how beautiful you are, how fit you are, at some point the clock's going to run out and we're going to depart. I'm going to leave this intensely awesome body of mine. If I don't talk myself up, nobody else does. So just give me some latitude here. One day I'm going to depart this body. And when I depart this body, this is just what Christians believe, that life will go on for me. And it will go on either to eternity with God or eternity separated from God. That's what Christians believe. That's what we get out of these ancient documents. That's what these, the writers of these ancient documents talk about. That's what Jesus talked about. One day we will all die. And it's not going to matter how perfect we were, how many I's we dotted and T's we crossed. The only thing that's going to matter is when we look back at that moment in history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, will we take on board the fact that Jesus did for us that which we could not do for ourselves? That which we could not do for ourselves. We were not able to remove that barrier that stands between us and a relationship with God called sin. The only way to do that, you've got two options. One, live absolutely, totally perfect. And by perfect, I don't mean your standard of perfection. I mean God's standard of perfection, which is so high. And Jesus made it very clear that none of us can do that. Do you remember when Jesus said, you know, you've heard it once before, don't call your brother an idiot, you're guilty of sin. Uh, Sorry, don't murder, you're guilty of sin. Then he took it a step further. He said, but I say to you, call him an idiot, you're guilty of murder. It's almost like he raised the bar. You know, remember when Jesus said this? He said that, that, that do not commit adultery. In other words, don't go after a woman that is not your wife. Don't go after her. Don't, don't do it. And then he said, but I'm going to say this to you. If you even lust after a person of the opposite sex, you look at them for one second longer than you should have. You have a fleet. If you do that, you might as well have committed the actual act. It's almost like Jesus raised the bar. I think what Jesus was trying to say was this. Understand very, very unequivocally, clearly, none of you will ever be good enough. Every one of you need me. What I'm about to do for you when I go to the cross, when I die, what I'm about to do for you is necessary for all of you, no matter who you are. And the only opportunity that we have to enter eternity with God is to accept that what Jesus did for us, what Jesus did on that cross was actually for us. That's the Christian story in a nutshell. But here's, here's, here's what I want to say. That's only half the story, yet that's the most part of the story we focus on, isn't it? Punishment for sin, forgiveness for sin. But there's another part to the story, another part to the gift that we don't seem to talk a lot about. And it's this, that Jesus actually came not just to pay the price for sin, not just to issue forgiveness to us, but he came to give us life. He came to give us 
life and life in abundance. Life in abundance. Did you know that as much as sin needed to be dealt with, that only took a moment? You ever thought about that? Dealing with your sin, my sin, sins, past, present, future. Did you know sin, from God's perspective, dealing with sin took a moment? Yeah? Jesus on the cross took care of sin. He took care of sin. Watch what the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 12. He says, speaking of the priests, see, in the, under the old covenant, what we call the, 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 basically the time before Jesus came, what happened was there was this system where they had to keep killing animals and spilling blood for the sins of the people. But they had it in their calendar. Anyone got a calendar for 2022 already? Got your calendar up? Yep. Well, in your calendar for 2022, you already have the dates in for the sacrifices. Why? Because you know you're going to stuff up again. You know you're going to sin. You know you're going to fall short of the mark again. So we're just going to lock in more sacrifices to cover our sins because we know we're going to keep on sinning. None of us is perfect. And so under the old covenant, they had these things locked in and these priests would come on in and they would do the sacrifices knowing and when they finished, they will see you next week, Barbara, and they'll be back and we'll do it again. And it was kind of like that. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, speaking of Jesus, offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, the sacrifice of Jesus was the last sacrifice needed for sin, past, present, future. It was the last sacrifice that was ever performed that got God's attention and that meant anything in God's economy. I know people are still sacrificing animals. We lived in India for some time, and I remember the first uh, sort of week we got there in this new place, it was in the middle of a festival where basically it was the Passover for, for them, and, and it was a Muslim community, and they were, it was eerie. During the day, all we heard was, bah, 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 all over the place. It's like every house had a lamb in it, and, bah, bah, bah. and then right on about 6 o'clock, it was, bah, bah, bah. you could have heard crickets. It just stopped because they all did their sacrifice at the same time. And then, of course, we made the mistake of walking out our front gate and one family says, hey, come, because we were the new white people in the community. And they called us over to their house and so we went over and we had to sit down with them and have a meal with them, which we did. And then we were so full. They, I mean, they feed you, they feed you, you know. It's not just this little, it's big. And so we finished the meal, we walked back to our house. As soon as we opened our gate, our gate had a creaking noise. As soon as the creak went, the next family popped out and called out, hey, come to my house, come to my house. So we closed the gate, went to their house, sat down, went through it again. I reckon we had about seven meals that night. It's the fullest I've ever been in my life. But some people are still doing sacrifices. Some Christians, there are probably people in this room and you're still trying to sacrifice for your own sins. What do I mean by that? Well, you, you'll walk around condemning yourself all day. You made a mistake, you did something wrong, and you'll walk away condemning yourself, kicking yourself, dragging your heels, oh, woe is me. If I can just prove to God that I hate sin as much as he does by not being happy, by not being joyful, by not lifting up my head, by, by committing to more hours of prayer and more chapters of the Bible every day and doing my things just to try to show God how sorry I am about sin and the, the fact that I fell short and missed the mark, if I can just do... Hey, what is, it's, that's just another type of a sacrifice, isn't it, for sin, yet Jesus sacrificed for sin 2,000 years ago, past, present, future, he's, he, he did everything that could be done to deal with sin being a blockage between you and relationship with God and the life that God wants to give you. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying, is that the barrier between God and man was removed in one moment by the last ever sacrifice that was needed. And that was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So sin, your sin was dealt with in a moment. So when you think about Jesus, if all you think about is sin, punishment for sin, forgiveness for sin, then you're too sin conscious and you're not enough God conscious. There's nothing wrong with being conscious of sin. I'm conscious of my sins. I know I fall short. But I don't live a sin conscious life because a sin conscious life robs you of the joy of the life God wants to give you. How many times did Jesus do something absolutely awesome heal a sick person, raise a dead person, preach something that was so wise that the opposition went, yeah, but you got nothing. How many times did Jesus do amazing miracles and things only to be, have the, the people that apparently knew God, the religious leaders, get in his face and go, yeah, well, you did healing, but you did it on Sunday. 
So forget the healing. We're not impressed. You did it on Sunday. Wrong day of the week. You sinned. And, and how many times do we have this picture in, the, in the, these gospel messages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the stories of those that, that witnessed Jesus or collected the stories of Jesus' life? How often do we find ourselves where we see people? It's interesting. The people who were most like Jesus didn't really like Jesus. You notice that in the Bible? The people that were most like him didn't really like him. But the people that were least like him, they loved him. They loved hanging out with Jesus. Prostitutes and drunkards and drug addicts and all that. They loved hanging out with Jesus. Yet the people who almost liked Jesus didn't really like Jesus. Why? Because they were so conscious, they were more sin conscious than God conscious. You're healed on the Sabbath. Why did you pluck the grains when it says, why did you this, why did you do that? And they just couldn't get past sin being the main narrative when we think about God. Jesus came to say the main narrative about God shouldn't be sin, it should be life. It should be life. I came to give you life. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It doesn't say that God so hated sin. The whole Jesus story comes across as God so hated sin. Does God hate sin? Yes, he does, but it's not the primary motivation for the Jesus story. The primary motivation for the Jesus story is for God so loved the world. Why is sin a problem? It's a problem because it stops the world having relationship with God. If we could sin and still have relationship with God, God probably wouldn't worry about it. It's the fact that sin robs us, that barrier between us and God robs him of relationship with the creation that he loves, you and me. The Jesus story is not just about the punishment for sin or, or forgiveness of sin. It's, it, God wants sin out of the way. Why? So he can begin to have a life with you. He wants to have a life with us because he loves us. And if you, every time you think of God or the Jesus story, if it's all sin related, you're missing the bigger point. You're, you're nailing step one, yes, but you're missing the bigger narrative of what God wants to do. God wants to bring life to us. The end game has always been about giving us a fulfilling and abundant life that brings glory to God. That's always been the end game as far as God is concerned. John 10:10, 10, 10, really interesting story. Go back and read it in your own time. Start in the book of John chapter 9 because 9 and 10 are one continuous story. Go back to chapter 9. A man's blind, gets healed by Jesus, gets interrogated by the religious leaders and again, instead of being impressed with the miracle, they're really angry because it happened on the wrong day of the week. Again, Jesus always seemed to do things on the wrong day of the week. Anyone else do things on the wrong day of the week? Jesus always seemed to do things on the wrong day of the week. And so they're angry at him. They interrogate this kid. They bring his parents in. They interrogate his parents, trying to prove he wasn't blind and and this miracle didn't happen. The guy's right there in front of you. And he's looking at you. And he was blind. If he was blind, he wouldn't be looking at you. He can't see, but he can see you. It's obvious that a miracle's been performed. But they're frustrated and angry because it wasn't done the right way, the religious way. It didn't happen the religious way. And they're caught up on that. And then Jesus begins to talk about, uh, it actually says that he goes and he finds this guy. He gets ostracized. This dude got kicked out of the church. Why? Because God decided to do something that only God could do. It wasn't the guy's fault. He didn't say, heal me on this. You know, I don't know whether the guy would have sat there and said, don't do it today, Jesus. Come back tomorrow. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to do it today. And so he heals the guy. The guy, as a result of something great that God did for him, he got kicked out of the church. Isn't that just sound stupid? But that's what happened. Read it, John 9 and 10. And so the Bible says that when Jesus found him, so Jesus heard this, and he went looking for the guy, finds the guy. And then he begins this long discourse. And as he starts to talk, the Bible says a crowd began to gather around, and he gets to this sentence. And every one of you would have heard this before, John 10, 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That word steal, that's actually where we get our modern word kleptomaniac from. It's the Greek word klepto. Any kleptomaniacs in here? Didn't think so. The thief comes to steal, to kill. That word kill, by the way, in the Greek, that's the same word that was used when they would sacrifice the Passover lamb. It's the same word that was used uh, for, for, for killing a sacrifice, sacrificing something on your own behalf. In other words, the devil steals from you. He takes from your life. He'll make you think that he's giving to you by following him, but he's not. He's stealing from you. Not only is he stealing from you, you're his sacrifice. That's, that's, what, that's what Jesus is saying. You're the devil's sacrifice. He's sacrificing you. That's what he wants for our life. 
He's sacrificing us. And he comes to destroy, which literally means to put out of the way and to render something totally useless. The devil has a plan for your life, but the beautiful thing is that God has a plan for our lives as well. He says a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then he says this, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus didn't just come because sin was the big issue. Sin was the starting point. He dealt with that 2,000 years ago. He removes that. What he wants us to do is come to him, have our sins dealt with, and then he wants to bring life to us. He wants to give you life, and he wants to give you an abundant life, a super abundant life. Here's what the word literally means. It means the state of one who is possessed of vitality or is animate, a life that's real and a life that's genuine. Wouldn't that be great sometimes? Sometimes church can be the biggest masquerade party in the world, can't it? We walk in the doors, we put our mask on and we, hey, hallelujah, hey, oh, Jesus, bro, bro. Inside, you'd be fighting with your husband or wife, you're angry at your boss, you've got all this going on. Church should be the one place where you feel comfortable to take your mask completely off and just be yourself. Not, I'm not talking about these masks, by the way, you've got to keep that on for now. By the way, next week, as of the new rules, we don't have to wear masks next Sunday, isn't that awesome? Next Sunday, we can literally take our masks off. But I'm talking about taking that mask off, that look that we feel like we have to be somebody. The abundant life Jesus talked about is is a life where you feel genuine and real and comfortable enough to be genuine and to be real. An active and a vigorous life, a life devoted to God. A life devoted to God. If that wasn't good enough, where he says, I've come to give you life and life to the full, literally means exceedingly, abundantly, supreme, superior, extraordinary, surpassing and uncommon just like the life of Jesus. This is what God has come to give us. He's come to give us life. And when you think of the Jesus story, if all you think about is sin, you're missing the main point. Matthew tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, something amazing happened in the temple. Uh, Matthew 21, I think it is somewhere there. There's this place called the Holy of Holies. And it was a place where the presence of God dwelt. And it was separated from the average Joe Blow like you and me. There was a high priest, and he was the only one that once a year was allowed to go into that particular place in the temple because the presence of God was there. When he went in there, they tied a chain to his leg because if he went in there and he had sin in his own world, stuff that wasn't dealt with in the other sacrifices that went on, he would drop dead and they would have to drag his body out. They couldn't even walk in there to get his body. Matthew tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, some things happened. There was a bit of an earthquake. Some things began to shake, rattle, and roll. And there was a curtain that went around the Holy of Holies. That curtain was about that thick, about as thick as a phone book. And it says that when Jesus died, that curtain was ripped. You can read it yourself, Matthew 21. From top to bottom, torn in half. Meaning Jesus had dealt with the sin issue on the cross. And all of those who would come through the sacrifice of Jesus could now have a personal relationship with God themselves. Nothing separating them. Don't have to go through a priest. Don't have to go through a pastor. Don't have to go through this and that. All we've got to do is go through the cross and we can have a relationship with God. Isn't that beautiful? When you think about the gift of God this Christmas, I want you to think about that. I want you to ask yourself the question, is Jesus' sacrifice, his death, is it all about sin? Is that all you get out of it? Is that all you think about? See, sin-conscious people, here's one thing I know. Sin-conscious people never enjoy God. They don't allow themselves to. They can't enjoy God. And sin-conscious people can't enjoy other people either because they're always waiting looking, picking apart, internalizing, judging, criticizing. That is not what Jesus died on a cross for. He died on a cross so that you and me can have life. And and I'll leave you with this. If you don't believe me, if that's not enough, I've only got a little bit of time here. Go home and read the book of John and get a pen and circle every time John says the word life. I came to give you life. I want to give you life. In fact, the gospel writers link the word life more to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ than they do sin. Unfortunately today, the church links sin more to the sacrifice of Jesus than we do life. Any wonder 
people aren't interested in Jesus. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning, God. I want to thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you, uh, God, for the gift that you have given to us in Jesus. Father, I pray for every person in this room right now, Lord. God, I don't know where people's hearts are at. But Father, if there are people here this morning and they don't know you, then, then Holy Spirit, I pray, do something in their life. Do something in their heart. Open their eyes. Let them see the reality of Jesus. Let them see how much you love them. Let them see what you did for them on the cross, God. Something that they will never be able to do for themselves, nor will anybody else ever be able to do for them. When you died upon that cross, you took their sin upon yourself. You were punished. God, you shed your blood for that which I deserve to pay for. But you did that for me, God, and I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray for those people in this room today, Lord, if they don't know you, then God, let them, even make them inquisitive, just to ask the questions, to read the book, God, to talk to somebody. This religion called Christianity has survived for so long, there's got to be a reason. It's been tried to be stamped out in so many nations, yet it still thrives. There's got to be a reason. Not many people died 2,000 years ago, and today millions of people around the world are still following their teachings. It just, it's not natural, not normal. So, Father, I pray for those people this morning. God, and for those of us that do know you, God, I pray this morning, if there are people here and they struggle to embrace life because they're so conscious of sin, they're walking around every day trying not to do the wrong thing, and if that's what people think relationship with you is about, then I pray this morning, Lord, would you set them free from that, God? Father, so they can actually begin to enjoy God, begin to enjoy this amazing gift that you have given to us, Lord. Begin to enjoy relationship with you, Lord, in spite of their imperfections, in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of the things that they get wrong. Lord, just let them begin to embrace the life you've given them and make the most of the time that you've given us down here, Father. And Lord, I also pray for those of us in this room that know you. God, in the next seven days, God, would you give us a chance to talk to somebody outside the walls of the church. God, give us a chance to talk to somebody that doesn't know you, God. There are people out there that, that have, this morning have no hope, this morning have no joy, cannot see a reason to get out of bed this mor- tomorrow, God. There are people bombing themselves out to forget yesterday. But Father, we have a good message for them about a God that loves them, wants to give them forgiveness, wants to bring life into them, wants to help them deal with that stuff. So Father, I pray in the next seven days, would you give us a chance to talk to those people, tell them this great news about Jesus, Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody this morning said, Amen. 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 Awesome. Hey, God bless you guys.